Good day. This is Slaven Gojković from Zagreb, Croatia, which is completely in winter and waiting for Christmas Eve to come. And uh, I'm broadcasting today in the name of Neurosurgical TV. We have three great presentations in this super Neurosurgical Sunday. First one is going to be Professor Aip Cherian from Nepal. Then we are going to have Professor Juha Hernesniemi, who is... Uh, also uh, currently in, in Nepal, and the third we will have Professor Perez from uh, Mexico City. So uh, I would uh, I will kindly ask the panelists to introduce themselves. We have here Andrea from uh, from Italy. Hello, Andrea. Hi, everyone. Uh, Andrea, and I am a resident uh, in uh, in Italy. Hi, everyone. Hello there. Uh, and we have Dr. Bennett from the hospital bed with us today. Yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone. Well, welcome to Neurosurgical TV. Unfortunately, I, I, I'm using a smartphone to connect, but that shows the versatility of the Hangout technology. And I'm handing the scalpel of Neurosurgical TV to Slavin today. I'm really humbled for this for this uh, amazing opportunity. And now I would like to introduce uh, our presenter, Dr. Cherian from Nepal. Uh, and it's all yours. Uh, to be talking to all of you. And, uh, you know, today uh, in the group that uh, we are talking about the tsunami from all over the world, Andrea is part of this group. So, in this group, we have neurosurgeons from almost uh, everywhere, China, India, Italy, Switzerland, uh, Iran, and many people have published and many people are doing cystinostomy. So, they had asked me, what are the ways of uh, uh, getting a larger window, optical carotid as well as the uh, lateral carotid window? So I had told them about the extra dural lateralization of the temporal lobe. So this is the concept that I will talk about today. This is very important also for uh, uh, basilar and superior uh, cerebellar artery aneurysms. Uh, the Japanese usually they do something called the pretemporal uh, mobilization. They take the first branch of MCA and uh, but here, what we are going to do is uh, in uh, presence of a swollen brain or a, a impending herniation, we take the temporal lobe, we give the temporal lobe to go laterally in an extradural manner. I'm going to, I'm going to go show you a paint drawing in a very simple way that I'm going to first share my screen now. Okay. So that is the frontal lobe, that is the temporal lobe, and that area is usually full of bone. Let's put brown color for bone. Ah, sorry. <laughs> so that is not what I meant. This is this is the this is the part which is the bone. And we generally want to get into a space which is, uh, let's put another color here. Let's say all the vessels and everything. The booty is here. Okay, so that is where we want to get in. So to get into this space, we have to first remove the bone, which also includes the anti-recliner process. And then the frontal and the temporal lobe needs to be separated. But you must understand one thing, to separate the frontal and the temporal lobes, the frontal and the temporal lobes are not sitting like this. So I'm going to clear this. Okay. The frontal and the temporal lobes are going to be like that which means the frontal is here the temporal is here and 
in the space between these two temporal lobes. I mean, actually the temporal lobe is here, but I have drawn it here so that you understand. And the space between these two temporal lobes, you have the sphenoid and the cavernous sinus. So you have a cavernous sinus here, you have the temporal lobe underneath this frontal lobe. That is how, that is how it is. So in the first diagram I showed you, you have to separate the frontal and the temporal lobes to get into the booty, to get into where you want. But to get into that, you need to separate the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. You, are you getting me? Yes, we can hear you everything, everything you're saying. Can you understand what I am saying? Yes. Thank you. Everybody? Yes. Uh, yes. So I'm yes, going to yes. say it again. Yes. So first on a two-dimension plane. So two-dimensional plane, we are looking from the lateral aspect. This is full of sphenoid bone and anterior clinoid process. We need to take this part off to get into this region in the skull base where all, all our vessels and systems, everything is. Now, on another aspect, this is the frontal lobe seen from above, temporal lobe, and this is the cavernous sinus. So cavernous sphenoid and cavernous sinus laterally. So to remove this front, this temporal lobe, and frontal lobe to abduct these two limbs. You need to strip this temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus. So to do that, you need a transcavernous dissection, preserving the TCM, therefore preventing disastrous bleeding. So this is in short, this is what, you, what I mean by extradural lateralization of the temporal lobe. So once you extradurally lateralize the temporal lobe, then you so you have optic nerve here, you have carotid there, so all these windows will become wider. Once they become wider, much easier for you to work. So this is the concept. So I'm going back to the video again now. Right. So the same thing I'm going to show you again because this is a concept last last time I posted a lot of people said they didn't really get the idea. So this is the frontal lobe and that's the temporal lobe. And again as I showed this this is all the bone. So we need to remove this bone first. And after that, take this temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus so that I open up this space. And that is where all our booty is, right? Our cisterns are there, our optic nerve is there, our carotid is there. Uh, to get into a comb, that is a key. To get into A1, that's a key. To get into basilar, it is a key, okay? To get into the interpedental fossa, that's a key. Everything, this region is very important. To widen up this region is, uh, but in, in usual cases, you really don't need to do all this. But say, for example, your uh, space is not sufficient like uh, in a basala, through this approach, then you may have to, you, you have to get into, say, for example, there's a skull-based tumor, which is occupying all the space. This approach is very good. So extradural lateralization of temporal lobe. Okay, let's see what we do. Now you go under the frontal lobe and then, of course, the principle is to remove all the bone there. Now we have removed most of the bone there. Okay, you can see that that part which you saw first has disappeared. Slow drilling there. That is a temporal, that's anterior to this part is a temporal lobe. And here you will see the superior orbital fissure. And that is an orbitomeningeal band. 
I always say is very, very important. Okay. The concept of the orbitomeningeal band to skull base surgery, extremely important. You cut this orbitomeningeal band. The only uh, contents of the orbitomeningeal band is the artery and the vein. So you coagulate that. Then you keep cutting, doing sharp dissection. People say peel. If you peel, you will take the TCM off. If you directly peel without sharp dissection, you will take the TCM off. And then you will have to resort to measures like injecting fibrin glue into the cavernous sinus. This is not good. Okay, this is an iatrogenic cavernous sinus thrombosis. Uh, you know, cavernous sinus thrombosis, you can get away with it most of the time, but. Uh, uh, sometimes it won't be very kind to you, okay? I know of cases when you have injected this glue, uh, you will have a, a very, very bad cavernous sinus thrombosis with proptosis, albeit temporary, but patient will have proptosis and the patient will have very bad swelling. So you don't want to do that. So, and plus, if you do that, there can be, without all this glue, you can have disastrous, meaning, not uncontrollable, but troublesome bleeding, you see. So now you are peeling the temporal lobe off. See, what I want is I want to open the angle between the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. That's exactly what I'm doing. That is the frontal lobe. That's the temporal lobe. So I'm opening the temporal lobe here and I will come to this angle and I will open the temporal lobe here. So the frontal and the temporal will the angle is going to open up and I'm going to take off everything in the middle, like the anterior clinoid process, for example. So basically, I'm getting a lot of access to the base. This is the most basic concept. And if you don't understand this concept, skull base, anterolateral skull base surgery is, uh, you know, going to be an enigma for you all the time. So you will wonder why this fellow, why this chap is doing all this. Uh, why is he cutting this? Why is he taking off the anterior climate process? You, you, you never understand. Now you must understand. I'm slowly, see, this angle is opening up now. See, now I have got the proximal control. That is the carotid. I've taken off all the bone there. And this angle is completely open. So this is the concept. Now I want to, I would like to, Uh, okay. Yes. Can you see me now? We are stopping yes, sharing. Yes, we can see you now. We can see you now. You stop screen sharing. Uh, Slavin and especially Andrea. Andrea, did you understand this concept? Yes. Yes, for me it seemed pretty straightforward, and you really put in the effort to to uh, tell us. I mean, everything that you draw and paint, we saw in the video. Yeah. So this is Dolens. Believe me. Yeah. Ninety percent of the neurosurgeons do not understand Dolens, and he was a genius for sure. There is no doubt about it. He understood that by removing this skull base, you get so much of space. Okay, anterolateral skull base or Dolens, you can say, uh, talk about modified Dolens approach, you can talk about any, any ways of approach, but this is what Dolens did. What he did was, he opened up the frontal and the angle between the frontal and the temporal lobe. You know, before, embryologically, the frontal and the temporal lobe was one tube first. Then there was no skull base. Anything underneath was underneath was easily accessible to everybody. But what happened later on, because of the lack of space, the, the two temporal lobes bent underneath the frontal lobe. It bent. It got bent underneath the frontal lobe. And all the vessels in the bottom, they became inaccessible. They became inaccessible. This was, this is the reason why most of when you try to access these vessels 
in, in case of brain swelling or in case of subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's very difficult. And unless you have a basal approach, it's impossible to do this. So what we are trying to do is we are going back to the embryology. Dolenz, what he did, I mean, I cannot take any credit for this, no, nor can any skull-based surgeon take any credit for this. Dolenz did this, and when he did this transcavernous peeling, what he did was not to just expose the cavernous sinus. His, his theory was that to get into the base, to get into a basilar aneurysm, or to get into the interpedangular fossa, this was very easy because he took off everything in between and he straightened out the angle. So this, in fact, forms the basis of extradural lateralization of temporal lobe. Now, what are the type? What are the times it is useful? So, for example, you have a herniated temporal lobe. If you have a herniated temporal lobe, and you try to access the opticocarotid window, this is almost so difficult. If you you are operating in such a scenario, I can assure you this is one of the most difficult things that you can get into, because when you try to access the opticocarotid window in this scenario. Uh, you will see the temporal lobe over the third now and sometimes reaching up to the carotid. It is herniating for sure. So in this case, lateralization of the temporal lobe in an extradural fashion really, really helps. So this is why we do the phosphorus We always lateralize. People ask me, why you have to do transcavernous approach for cystinostomy? Now, I hope, Andrea, do, do you understand me? Do you understand why yes, we do this? Yes, yes, yes. Right. yes, we yes write, yeah, we will write the paper on this. I mean, somebody was suggesting that we write the paper. Uh, the Swiss group, uh, Roy, was suggesting that we write up this paper. So since yes. you have understood this concept, uh, I will prepare a draft and I will put a video and I can also show some cadaveric videos also. So as to how and maybe draw some very basic diagram just I'd, like I drew today so that when I am drawing you understand as to what I am doing. So uh, with that, this is the concept of Dolan's approach and this is what he tried to achieve this is exactly what we are trying to achieve today. Thank you very much. Any questions, anybody please? Yes, thank you, Dr. Bucherian. We will open the discussion for this great lecture. Feel free to ask any questions. I will start off with saying uh, that I think it was really uh, remarkable the way how simple you explained this because I think one of the reasons why some concepts are not so generally understood is because uh, through lots of texts and, and uh, images which accompany them, sometimes it's hard to grasp the the meaning of, of something, I mean, the, the proper meaning. And I think that uh, the effort you put in is really what, for example, we need as as young generation who really tr tries to, in, in, this, in a little time, learn great concepts. So I'm, uh, this, I think this presentation was very beneficial. I cannot wait to come and review it a few times because I really want this concept to stick to me. So I think we are cre creating here a collection of uh, videos which are really first aid in a way, but also uh, guiding us, guiding our process of thinking in the direction which we couldn't be able to have without these basic knowledges. Because as you said, when you when you know this basics, then you know other things as well. I mean, you can you can talk about modifications of the Dolan's approach. You can talk about cystinostomy with this concept. And you can talk about skull base also, I mean, and uh, as well as embryology, which is fascinating for myself. So I would like to, I hope I, I managed to enlighten a bit of your thoughts with, with this um, assertion of mine. Yeah, See, frankly, Slavin, everything is simple. At the bottom of it, everything is simple, but uh, you know, 
uh, what happens finally is uh, the egos and uh, everything puts makes things complicated you know um, if somebody said that I wish when I was a resident if somebody told me that the objective of a Dolling's approach is this I would have saved probably 10 years so but then nobody tells you that everybody keeps on giving uh, diagrams, more diagrams, and uh, how you dissect this and how you dissect that. and But you don't understand your objective. If you do not understand your objective, then how much ever things you, you keep on saying is useless. So, so that is why I wanted to go to the real basics today and make you understand as to what is your objective. And once you understand your objective, everything falls in. Very simple. Anterolateral skull base is just this nothing more uh, i also think that uh, i i i talk i talk with many colleagues of mine and a lot of uh, young colleagues or a lot of young neurosurgeons are losing interest in in uh, approaches uh, to the cavernous sinus because of the limited uh, of the limited um, surgery that you can perform perform now and i think this concept, uh, as you can apply in new, in new approaches uh, like system not like trauma surgery, I think is very interesting. Thank you. Shall I hand over to you, Ha, please? Well, I would just like to ask um, our new member, Margarida, to uh, introduce herself, if you can, please. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. My name is Margarida. I'm from Brazil. Now I'm living at Porto. I'm a young neurosurgeon. I, unfortunately, I came late for your presentation, but I, I was very uh, interested to know about the Link's approach and lateral school base, because for me, I have no experience. It's a very difficult approach. Every time somebody called the Link's approach, I got my get chilling because for me it's difficult to understand it's all about diagrams and at my formation i just see one the link in approach in my life so it's very useful when you come here and explain for us the youngest how you do that thank you very much thank you thank you for the kind words margarita um I mean, this is being recorded, so this uh, this talk will be there, and maybe you can look up, and then maybe you can tell me what you think about. I wanted to keep it very simple. You know, people do not like it to keep it simple because you know they are called people who keep it simple. They are called simpletons, or in other words, idiots. Mm -hmm. But it is always better to be an idiot rather than be a very haughty, egoistic. Huh? Uh, somebody who's not understood okay so okay. it is uh, so maybe you can uh, look up the very simple drawings and all these showed and then maybe you once you see that you will understand what is this approach about and i'm sure after that you will not think that dolenz is a very complicated approach it's a genius approach in fact Mingo dolenz must be a genius okay the we all agree on that. We will ask you to please hand on the then uh, the the space to to Professor Hernes Niemi. Thank you again so much for your great presentation.